Yep, perfect. Thank you. Um, Okay, beautiful. So, um, hi, my name is Sita, and I am going to be presenting a research proposal um, titled Platform Trans Inclusion on Pronoun Fields and Commodification. So, practices of pronoun sharing that affirm an individual's agency regarding how gendered language should be applied to them are increasingly common. This supports trans people by prioritizing an individual's own experience and internal knowledge over state-sanctioned gender assignment and other indexes of gender. However, as social movements achieve victories, corporate incorporation and appropriation often follows. As society moves increasingly online, social media and communication companies expand their ability to shape our realities through their platform architecture. From algorithms that show us content to messaging and effective reaction functionality, these companies engineer mechanisms for how we relate online, constructing and constraining possibilities for how we position ourselves in relation to others. As part of this, responding to a movement of people sharing their pronouns in social media bios, several multinational social media and meeting corporations have introduced fields on their platform specifically for people to share their pronouns. So in this research proposal that will be for my qualifying project and leading into my dissertation research, I frame this phenomenon by discussing work on language commodification, rainbow capitalism, and data and social media corporations. I then rudimentally outline an analysis of public facing corporate discourse, public uptake in response posts, and connect social media companies to their broader social impact. And then conclude. Um, I'd be excited by any thoughts and feedback that folks have. So language commodification has been studied in linguistics in a variety of ways, and such work often confronts the complex intersections between competing language ideologies, thinking through what ways of understanding language are best able to be mobilized by capital. For example, previous work has looked at the way corporations define language and acts of translation as fungible in order to accrue expansion, profit, and control, rather than seeing language, as linguists often do, as local, cultural, and embodied. However, while research looks at commodification of languages themselves, of language learning markets and materials packaged for the education market and language repertoires in the case of prescripted phone conversations um, as a form of commodified language for work, um, it's a new area of research to explore language commodification in pronoun sharing aspects of trans language reform. So the term rainbow capitalism refers to companies using LGBT plus terminology, symbols, and concepts as a way to seem progressive and to expand their sales and profits. This is an extension of the way the gay market has been capitalized on by corporations since the 70s through marketing towards gay consumers. And in the age of targeted advertising, queer people are served a plethora of queer themed advertisements, which often represent queer people in stereotypical tokenizing ways. This market is predicated on the existence of a middle-class queer consuming subject, which positions those with socioeconomic privilege as queer while invisibilizing the exploitation of others. The production of a visible queer subject frequenting queer catering businesses, toting queer themed commodities produced often by women in the global South is at once buying into an idea of queerness synonymous with being a certain kind of consumer and basing a gendered subjecthood on the labor of those suffering gendered exploitation. In addition to and often utilized by um, queer theme advertisements and commodities, queer and trans language practices are increasingly used by companies in furthering their socio-political economic goals. So-called gay slang is scrolled across t-shirts and Siri has a non-binary voice option. Pronouns and pronoun practices themselves have created a market for a range of pronoun pins, badges, and jewelry. And as of the topic of this paper, pronouns are mobilized by companies both internally and externally to create a sense of queer inclusion. The way that such practices are often conceived of and viewed is itself predicated on an individualized neoliberal subject with the socio-cultural mediated capacity to act, where all are assumed to equally have capacity to self-determine the way their gender will be understood by others. As previous research shows, this fails to take into account the different ways that visibility is and isn't sanctioned for marginalized queer people who occupy a range of positionalities. This idea of um, rainbow capitalism is in conversation with the idea of homonationalism or pinkwashing where LGBT plus affirming language, imagery and policy is positioned by nation states for sociopolitical purposes. 
while researchers are increasingly taking a critical stance on data. Um, as the empirical field, linguistics in general so often conceptualizes data as neutral. What is left out of these discussions is the political and economic infrastructure underlying the language data used. And similar to companies' data collection, this gap allows linguistic research to be abstracted from the embodied power relations of the internet. However, we can use the lens of data colonialism to highlight the ways that online data is not in fact neutral, as many people here today have discussed. Um, data colonialism names the process of turning every aspect of human life into data mines for profit as the extension of colonial processes of extracting value from life. Data colonialism both draws our attention to a historical grounding of current systems in colonialism and foregrounds a new kind of extractive relationship that technology has with all aspects of human life. It captures the continuation of the world being restructured through colonial violence and subsequent imperial economic policies to channel resources in a particular way. When it comes to sociocultural linguistic analysis of social media, there is some work that has taken a critical approach to the way that social media is shaping our reality in line with state and corporate in, um, interests. For example, platform architecture, such as content algorithms influenced by advertising money, are shown to promote discourses such as neo-fascism gaining increased prevalence and circulation. By investigating platform architecture around pronouns, this current work builds on such work that takes a critical perspective on data and social media. So in um, the research that I'm proposing, the above thematic discussions will be fleshed out through the use of imperial analysis, um, empirical analysis. In this section, I propose three sites of analysis. So firstly, looking at corporate discourse on pronouns. Um, secondly, looking at the public uptake of this discourse through um, response posts and articles. And thirdly, looking at connections between social media corporations who have pronoun features and their inequality producing effects in the global south. So. In my initial analysis, I ask what linguistic strategies do tech companies use when positioning themselves in relation to trans inclusive features and what audience are they targeting and what images does this um, portray. So discourse, discourse analysis allows us to investigate pronoun inclusion statements on social media companies corporate websites, examining the discursive strategies that are used to create benevolent trans inclusive personae. An example is a 2021 article on Zoom's blog by um, diversity, equity and inclusion lead, Ronnie Dickerson Stewart, titled New, More Easily Add and Manage Your Pronouns in Zoom. Um, and it outlines the pronoun feature that at this time was new. So in this piece, the author centers the idea of care. So care is not only the first word of the statement, but is positioned as being Zoom's core value. Zoom through this is positioned as being able to perform effective labor, or at the very least, readers are reassured that the effective labor performed by Zoom's employees will reach them in a context where technological solutions are increasingly given to socio-reproductive um, crises. In the service of this, verbs and adverbs throughout the statement position Zoom team as benevolent and caring. They understand, they help, and they carefully listen. Further, the Zoom staffer repeats the phrase our users throughout, interpolating users of Zoom's service into a relationship of caregiver and care receiver or owner and owned, which has interesting implications when it comes to the ownership of data. Further, Stewart in using the inclusive first person plural throughout assumes a clear collective voice. The disembodied we is tactfully ambiguous, giving a sense of unity and thus erasing the complexity of opinions and positions within the company, subsuming individual workers into the values and perspective of the corporation as a whole. By positioning the features as an exciting new thing that they are introducing without acknowledging trans histories, the writer temporarily locates the need for attention to trans issues as something new, implying that they couldn't have thought about such things before. Um, the author legitimizes the Zoom team's actions through appealing to the community authority of educators, social organizations, and diversity leaders, linking the actions of the company to formal work done by those with institutional or community power and credibility. And this is strengthened by the use of quotes, for example, from the Associated Director for Transgender Representation at the Media US nonprofit Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, who reinforces Zoom's careful listening. 
So through an analysis of such features, we can see the way that linguistic choices when discussing pronoun features position Zoom as progressive and caring, able to provide effective labor towards those who are in a relationship with it. This kind of discourse analysis could be complemented through computational methods. Um, for example, keenness analysis could be used to distinguish central terms that characterize the way that such companies frame themselves around this issue. Um, and this is one way to expand such an analysis so that it can locate central ideas across a number of texts, as well as the kind of more specific um, discourse analysis. Um, but because of the kind of small data set, it remains to be seen whether such analysis is feasible. It is not only significant how the companies position themselves, but also how such discourses are being taken up by the public. So in the second part of my analysis, I ask how are people framing such companies when discussing pronoun options and how are people reifying or resisting corporations own framing? So similar to in the previous analysis, I use discourse analysis, but in this case to examine response articles and videos from news outlets and public blogs or vlogs by trans and otherwise allied speakers, zooming in on how people frame companies as caring entities in these conversations. I'm particularly interested in the way that trans people and allies um, talk about companies in these sort of conversations because I'm interested how in how aligned political actions by companies affect the perception of such companies by people who are ultimately harmed by their actions. And again, discourse analysis of such responses could be paired with computational tools such as sentiment analysis, um, potentially using SDM to get a fuller picture of the effective way people are responding to the introduction of pronoun features. Lastly, I propose to link an analysis of the ways that corporations are positioning themselves and how this is being received with an analysis of their global inequality producing effects. So in doing this, I'll take on case studies of three social media and meeting corporations using pronoun sharing features. Um, so Zoom, Meta and LinkedIn. And in this analysis, I'll show the direct relationship between these corporations and inequality producing effects globally. Um, so for example, Facebook now under company parent company Meta um, has been called out in the media for a number of cases. So for example, exploiting workers across Africa, particularly in Nairobi, by employing a company that pays workers $1.50 an hour to moderate horrific content, such as sexual assault and abuse, which leaves many with significant mental health conditions. Um, moderating content along political lines that favor US geopolitical positions, such as deleting Palestinian posts from Instagram, and failing to invest in content moderating in the global south, resulting in an abundance of hate speech. And this includes hate speech directed against queer people um, as well. And taking over the internet in many global south countries through an aid program um, aimed at connecting people to the internet for free through a meta-owned app which prioritizes meta sites. So in these issues, we can see how Meta expands its market, market globally, using the guise of aid to tether people's whole access to the internet to a particular US corporation, how it exploits the labor of Global South workers and makes geopolitical moves in the content it moderates. Within this, corporations that espouse queer inclusion and platform features in the Global North fail to protect queer people from hate speech in the Global South. So in conclusion, this paper outlines potential directions in analyzing the use of trans-affirming language practices for corporate gain. In it, I discuss ideas of language commodification, rainbow capitalism, gendered labor, and data collection by social media corporations. Following this, I propose a mixed method analysis of corporate discourse to understand the way that companies construct themselves with respect to pronouns, the social media uptake of such discourses by queer and allied people, and the exploitative effect these companies have on people in the global south. In all this work advances linguistic research on trans language by shedding important light on how trans affirming practices can be used in the interest of capital. It asks us to consider trans affirming language practices, not just in the context of a cis-sexist society, but also in the exploitative context of global capitalism. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I welcome any questions and feedback and this um, QR code is a link to the slides as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cedar. And we've got time for maybe one question. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, are there any questions on Zoom? Well, maybe I can ask a quick question. So uh, I guess my question is, 
do you think I really appreciate your your study and your further proposals and the analysis you did with the with the zoom example but do you think the people you know company is a big entity and do you think maybe the people who are writing those texts maybe they have should they be considered separately or the people who are implementing the pronoun feature should they be considered separately from you know maybe the ceos or maybe the other branches of the company that do some other things yeah that's a really interesting question i think definitely like often um corporations and institutions do rely on the labor of queer and trans people in order to kind of like make themselves seem more inclusive and so i don't mean to sort of like diminish the work that people are doing and the deep care that queer and trans people are taking in kind of trying to make um, society a better place for queer people um, but any work that is within sort of these corporations is still being used by the corporations ultimately for their own gain and so while the individual work you could see it kind of in a specific separate way still it's like within the public facing um, like whole thing of the company itself and when people are looking at um, for example zoom and the pronoun feature they're not thinking of oh this individual person who did this particular work um, is a trans person who cares about inclusivity they're thinking oh zoom um, as a company like supports me as a trans person with my pronouns um, and so yeah I hope that sort of answers your question yes thank you let's thank the speaker again